Good evening, morning, afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us virtually today for a discussion on the acceleration of fossil fuels phase out. My name is Sharmay Chung, and I am originally born and raised in Hong Kong, and I'm currently a master's student at the Hurdy School of Governance in Berlin, Germany. And I'm currently a youth engagement group member of the Climate Overshoot Commission. So the COP28 meeting concluded with the adoption of the so-called UAE consensus, which calls for transitioning away from fossil fuels in energy systems in a just, orderly, and equitable manner, as well as tripling renewable energy capacity globally and doubling the rate of energy efficiency improvements by accelerating the phase down of unabated coal power and reducing methane emissions. In the context of the framework for the global goal on adaptation adopted by the parties, the consensus sets a series of targets related to both substance like food, water, and health, and processes like risk assessment, planning, implementation, and monitoring. Also, the new collective quantified goal on climate finance is set to be finalized by the next conference. And separately, the parties have commenced the operationalization of the loss and damage fund to be hosted initially by the World Bank. And by the end of the COP28, pledges to the fund have totaled to 717 million. So on the topic of COP28 and its outcomes, I'm honored to have with us today four distinguished panel speakers, each coming from a different part of the world, engaging in a different aspect of climate action, who will contribute invaluable insights to the outcomes of COP28. First, today we have Ms. Kim Campbell, the former Prime Minister of Canada, who is also a member of the Climate Overshoot Commission. Kim Campbell served as Canada's 19th and first female Prime Minister in 1993, and she is now a member of the Climate Overshoot Commission. Next, we have Mr. Michael Obersteiner, Director of the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford, and he is a science advisor to the Climate Overshoot Commission. His research experience stretches from biophysical modeling in the areas of ecosystem, forestry, and agriculture to economics finance and integrated assessment. We also have with us today Mr. John Keoli, the Executive Director of Green Africa Foundation, and is also the Chairperson of Kenya Climate Change Working Group. He has conducted, on key thematic, conducted research on key thematic areas within climate change that informed Kenya's Climate Change Act. He also facilitated several extensive grassroots sensitization and consultation meetings on climate change and the climate change bill and was appointed by the president as a member of the National Climate Change Council. Lastly, we also have with us today Akash Ransen, who is a climate optimist. Like me, he is a youth climate advocate, but unlike me, he is also a public speaker, a photographer, and an author. He published a book called I Am a Climate Optimist, which aims to give answers to those who wonder what to do about climate change. It covers all aspects of day-to-day -day life like food, textile, transportation, tourism, home, and business. So to say the very least, we have a very diverse group of speakers with us today, whom I look forward to hearing from and have a thoughtful discussion with. So I guess a first question to all of our panelists today, the COP28 has attracted a lot of attention in the midst of global crises and major headlines on wars. Um, it has brought much advances on putting forward new commitments to address um, methane emissions and triple renewable energy. But what is your assessment on this COP, its debates and its outcomes? Mm -hmm. Michael, are you gonna jump in? Yeah, yeah, I can, okay. Um, well, it's uh, it's kind of an interim COP um, when you when we reflect of uh, of uh, just going back to Paris and the Paris Agreement, uh, which in, enshrined the one point five uh, or two degree target. Um, most of it uh, content wise was already there. So you know, if you want to hit one point five then you actually need to phase out uh, fossil fuels uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, same for methane um, and um, many of the other issues like the tripling um, of renewables, but also uh, the food system emissions. 
So in a way, there's there's absolutely no news uh, in in this COP. However, um, you know, like uh, like in the in the science of resilience, uh, redundancy is very important. So you need to say the same things over and over again, maybe in a in a little bit of a, of a different form. And uh, and this COP uh, basically served that function, but also clarified. And this this is quite a, a big signal and needs to be celebrated that uh, one topic, the fossil fuels, were directly discussed. And we have a wording, some might not uh, be incredibly happy, but we have a relatively strong wording of uh, on the fossil fuels. And, uh, and this symbolically by the UAA, uh, which uh, which is uh, really a big step forward that some of these major oil producers uh, actually agree to this notion of uh, transitioning away from uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, so hopefully this might uh, might trigger some real actions, uh, but uh, that's yet to be seen, and we will for sure dis discuss quite a bit on this. Uh, in the coming minutes. If I can jump in, I think that, oh, sorry, I have to unmute myself. Yeah, okay, I think I'm unmuted. Um, if I can jump in, I think uh, you've put your finger on what is the key issue is the semantic interpretation of the expression transition away from. I think those of us on the Climate Overshoot Commission would think that's a bit of a weak formulation because we talked about phasing out. Uh, that means coming to an end. Transitioning away, does that mean just doing less than before? And, this, and what worries me about that is that because in the area of direct air capture and some of the technologies, and I've just been reading about some technologies that are new, that there's two approaches to direct air capture. One is to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequester it permanently. And the other is to take it and use it to, to you know, exploit more fossil fuels. So there's a lot of denial out there in fossil fuel land. And we know that in this COP, there was a huge number of lobbyists from the fossil fuel industry. And certainly the chair of the COP was somebody who uh, was quite explicitly talking about his plans to expand uh, the production of fossil fuels. So I think what we've got um, is on the one hand, a declaration which can be used certainly um, against those who would talk about increasing fossil fuel use or continuing production without any change. I mean, they're stuck on this transitioning away from, but is transitioning away from as strong a formulation as phasing out? Because phasing out means at some point, this is going to come to an end and we have to think about what that's going to be. And as the longer that people go without acknowledging that, the greater the incentive to avoid phasing it out because the higher the cost. If people refuse, it's like if you refuse to look after your health and then at some point, you know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're in a real, a real crisis. Um, you know, you, you, you can get yourself in a situation, you say, well, you know, I have to have a, you know, a, a transplant or something because, you know, I'm, I'm at such, such risk, but you put yourself in that situation. So here we are. Uh, but I think what I would say um, is that, a, you know, I have, as some of you know, I, I live in Italy and I've been doing some interesting discussions with people who are at the European University Institute and, and, and thinkers in, in Northern Italy. And there's some very interesting work being done, not just here, but elsewhere too, about legal accountability of uh, fossil fuel companies. And I think the more we create a consensus about the fundamental problem of fossil fuels, that they're not just an accidental contributor to climate change, they are a fundamental driver of it. The more we encourage countries and societies to use the other levers they have, uh, legal accountability, financial accountability, to force fossil fuel companies to acknowledge that the era of fossil fuels has to come to an end. So I agree with Michael that the cops are always, you know, the glass is half full, the glass is half empty, and I'm eager to hear from our, our climate optimists, because I think actually retaining resilience and looking for the, 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 the steps forward is important to keep us from all, you know, throwing ourselves out of a basement window and <laughs> killing ourselves out of despair. We have to keep moving. We know how hard this is and it gets harder and harder as more people invest money and time in denying the reality. But I think, as Michael pointed out, the, 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 the key issue 
is what will be taken from the expression transition away from, as opposed to what we on the overshoot committee recommended, which was to phase out. Um, our approach was, was not in denial. And we tried to create a formula, and we can talk about this in this conversation, that would help people take the steps necessary to do this. And that would do be, this would happen in the context of justice. But what's interesting, and I just concluded, let others jump in, but we have with us a representative of Kenya who has actually done an extraordinary job of moving away from fossil fuels and creating uh, uh, an alternative energy environment. And yet Kenya is one of the countries that we probably think of as being needing of the help the, the, of the loss and damage. And what we've seen is that it's quite possible for developing countries to perhaps leapfrog over fossil fuel use. So all of the excuses we're using to keep fossil fuels in use, they may be necessary for some countries and it may be part of a, an equation for a transitional phase of both economic resources as well as creating the infrastructure for uh, a non-fossil fuel economy. But it's really important to remember that a country like Kenya, which was highly motivated to do this, has shown that you don't have to be one of the modern advanced industrial democracies to to make some really important um, and world affecting decisions. So I'll leave it there and just say that semantics is everything. And maybe we should have brought a, you know, a semantics expert onto the panel to, to parse it. But I think we all know what the challenge is, that we're, we're there, but not there. And that's because weasel words have been an integral part of the, of the discussion. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, Kenya as an example because I also have a question for Mr. Keoli. So from what I know, um, Kenya is a country with 75% of its energy coming from renewable sources, which is a great example for the world on energy transition, especially now that we have the goal of tripling renewable energy um, across the world. So is the fact that such a successful transition best practice not valued, maybe perhaps part of the problem with um, energy transition right now? And in your view, should the country benefit from specific support, perhaps from international aid to achieve this sort of transition? Thank you. Thank you very much. Last three years, Kenya lost 2.5 million livestock. When you talk about cows, goats, sheep, we are talking about livelihood. We are talking about a bank account that takes about 20 years to 15 years to accumulate. Our pastoralists lost that amount of livestock. We are not even counting our wildlife, our heritage. Remember Kenya is a tourism destination that is dependent on our ecosystems. So people come here to visit our parks. People, tourists come here to visit areas that are supported by ecosystem, we lost quite a chunk of it. When the rains came, 200,000 acres of land was washed away by the floods that we got in the, in the ongoing El Nino. We have lost more than 100 people in the last three weeks. We have lost houses of more than 20,000 people in the last one month. What that means is that it's not about just a talk. It's about livelihood going. It's about the accumulation of CO2 crushing our livelihoods. This is the propelling reason why Kenya switched to renewable energy in terms of generation of power. We have potential in Africa for renewable energy, especially in solar and wind energy. When we look at issues about civil society and how we are contributing to the discussion about COP, discussion about uh, issues of representation, the civil society organizations are representatives of the people. We are the representatives of the last mile. Whereas we are talking our people are not represented. We are not at the same page. These voices of the unsung heroes are not on the table. Therefore, the civil society punctuates a very important uh, part of the discussion. In terms of assessing the commitments of COP28, 
I want to pose a question. Are there commitments made by international community at the COP28? Are they symbolic gestures or are they real uh, gestures? Are they the same things we had from Copenhagen? Are these the same stories we had from Cancun? Are the commitments that were said more than 20 years ago delivered? I pause there and say that the COP28 was very strategic in unpacking the issue of uh, loss and damage. Even before the COP started, we got commitments. But are these commitments going to turn into support, real support at the grassroots level? And that's where the community needs to raise its voice. That's where we are saying we want to see the reality of the people of the ground coming to COP and the language of the COP being understood by everybody, including the indigenous communities, the people who have no much knowledge about the language used in negotiation. Kenya has a success story in terms of energy, in renewable energy, but we are still a long way in terms of what we call unbankable projects of projects which are small, but reaching to the last mile. That's like a simple solar lantern that my grandmother needs to make, to, you know, to use in terms of uh, lighting and also to be able to charge her phone and also the cooking stove that she has to be able to avoid indoor air pollution. What can transform this? And the next thing is where I'm going into. The Paris Agreement said, we are going to support technical transfer of technology to help us. And this technology will be, will be coupled up with finance. We have not seen adequate additional financial support to support this kind of actions. So we are still a long way to go in terms of reaching the last mile, in terms of um, reaching the last mile and to realize that energy is a justice issue. More than 800 million of Sub-Saharan Africa are still not having clean, accessible, clean energy. What that means is that our vaccines cannot be put in the refrigerators. Our mothers cannot deliver when they want to because they have no facilities in the clinics which are not electrified. We cannot have the simple things like water being pumped because we don't have electricity. So the call for action here is let's raise our ambition. Let's call for action. Let's have finance. Let's have technology transfer to reach the last mile. I thank you for your kind attention. Yeah, thank you so much for your thoughtful remarks, Mr. Keoli. Um, one thing that I got out from your your um, from your comments is that there seems to be uh, an increasing frustration from the civil society on the commitments being made by um, governments and parties, and yet these commitments not being materialized. And I recall, uh, Mr. Obersteiner, you mentioned something about the Paris Agreement. So I wanted to pose a question to you. Um, so with the Paris Agreement, uh, countries have set what we call NDCs, National Determined Contributions, which are ambitious, but then it turns out after all these years that they are not implemented fully. So in your view, uh, as a science advisor, uh, are there any uh, sort of international mechanisms currently that are missing that you think can have transform transformative impacts uh, to support countries in their transition out of fossil fuels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a difficult one. That's a difficult one. Huh? Um, so... Uh, well, where shall I start? So, so basically, I'm I'm currently running a, a global um, network of countries uh, where we'll try to ratchet up the the NDCs, mostly in the land use sector. Um, uh, and uh, what we see is is uh, in many countries there's rather little interest actually because climate change is not the highest priority these days. That's uh, that's a big issue. Uh, the, the other thing is, is um, um, in the negotiations, and I think that's really a big, big problem, is uh, 
there is no sense yet what is the fair share every country should really contribute to. Mm -hmm. So currently it's uh, voluntary pledging. And uh, what we have seen from countries on the voluntary pledging is that we are between uh, one third or maybe even two thirds in terms of pledging where we should be. Uh, however, you know, pledging is one thing, uh, acting is another thing. And on action, uh, we are really lagging behind. It's even, even to a degree that, uh, you know, countries who pledge, but actually have uh, no uh, proper calculations done on how they would actually achieve it. Not even talking about really enacting uh, true, true mitigation measures. And that's uh, not only uh, countries of low capacity. These are also countries who have the capacity, but just choose not to prepare. So that's, uh, that's really serious. And, uh, you know, so, so, if uh, if countries didn't really negotiate on what their fair share is, uh, or even establish the principles about it, um, then then we really have a problem. And I give you I give you one example which I many times use is uh, so there is one country Switzerland they try to calculate their emission reduction target for today. Uh, in a, a fair share world. And what they found was that they should reduce their emissions by 120%. So this means uh, they should actually proactively already today be net negative. So take CO2 out of the atmosphere. However, in the logic of the climate negotiations, they put forward a rather generous, generous for, for themselves, generous um, target of uh, net zero by 2050, like every other country. And if every other country goes for uh, net zero by 2050, we will sure, surely create a massive overshoot. Uh, and that's exactly what, uh, what, we are, what we are shooting for. So in a way, uh, the logic and the mechanisms of the negotiations, avoiding to have an honest discussion on responsibility, is uh, is uh, is a major is a major uh, major problem. And even now, with uh, the wording uh, of transitioning away from uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, many low-cost producers, Saudi Arabia, but also the UAE, um, they consider themselves as low-cost producers. So they probably calculate they have a right to pump the last drop of oil. And what do they do? They actually announce over and over again new uh, uh, fields that they explored uh, and actually consider viable for commercial exploitation. So, so he, even here, uh, who transitions away and on what pace has not been really discussed at all. And the logic, again, is that uh, some, and some of the biggest now, think they will be the last one and they have a right to expand because the more higher cost uh, uh, producers will, will go out of the market, which they won't because prices are high and will continue to be high. So here we have really... Uh, really fundamental flaws that have not been addressed yet. And uh, and I think we are running out of time on the negotiations as well. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, um, I I hear that you, you're talking about that there's this major flaw in climate negotiations right now on who takes the responsibility, who has the capacity, and of those who have the capacity, who is then taking the time to prepare and to mitigate, uh, to commit to mitigation actions. So, um, you know, the tensions between developed and developing economies um, seems to reappear every single year at the conference of the parties. And it seems to be growing larger as we move forward to the next conferences, um, as we enter these negotiations for effective climate action. So I have a question for Akash. Um, would you say actually that the situation is more complex than developed and develop, developing economies um, because these eco economic blocks are you know, dubbed as heterogene heterogeneous, um, comprising of um, wealthy countries, uh, rich economies, um, and also 
less wealthy nations, but then these economies in themselves um, are actually not um, more diverse uh, in their levels of dependency on fossil fuels, um, their emissions level, and their consumption of fossil fuels. So in your view, how do we find an equitable solution where um, interests and priorities are so dispersed within countries and within alliances? Um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having me on board and for the question. Um, I think we already have a solution, but then uh, the solution is powerless. We have to give back the power to the solution we have. And the solution here in this space is UN, right? Um, so I believe in this space where UN can step in and other countries can humble down, right? All of these underdeveloped, small, and developing countries are suffering from a problem they actually didn't really cause. While the developed nations who have built a whole economy over fossil fuel are procrastinating today. So a very simple reason, as a leader, all the leaders want to show that, okay, I'm keeping the GDP of the country safe, and they don't want to let go of the money to help another country. For them, their interest is to win the election and to keep themselves out there as a leader. So whatever it takes for them to see the self agenda, they just want to focus on this. And we can't let developed countries to set the targets and frameworks. Obviously, if I'm the one who has to pay the money for a mistake and I'm the judge, I'm going to be biased. I'm going to say that, okay, it's not really that a big uh, problem or that a big issue, or even if it is, I can give you a little bit of money, not as much as you really demand for. And that's what is happening in COP as well. We have seen that they have acknowledged several uh, agendas or whether it's loss and damage or any other agendas, activists or policymakers or leaders have been pushing out there. They would accept it. They would acknowledge it. And it's somewhere the word play as well. What Kim also talked about. Even this time, what they have done with loss and damage fund, they have given $770 million versus we need somewhere about $400 billion. So they did acknowledge um, it's not that they are not doing something. Uh, so we can't really point finger at them as well, like directly, because they have a very good PR going on globally. That okay, we acknowledge no media really want to talk about this. That okay, yes, they did acknowledge, but what is it that they are offering? It's in a way, a country is greenwashing. What I really believe is all the nations have to take UN as a serious body and allow them to take the action backed by science. What's happening here, all these bigger nations who are powerful are the one funding UN. And no doubt the results which come out of UN that's biased because we are fixated on this one thing that how much money do I have? It's greed in simple, re in simple points. And we are putting science aside for the sake of our greed. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, that's very thoughtful. And um, in terms of who gets to speak at, um, at these conferences, um, we also know that civil society is pivotal to both the design and implementation to climate action, as Mr. Keoli can speak more about as well. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what do you think of um, the commitments from um, the international community at COP28? Are they symbolic? And do you think it's the beginning of effective change? And do you think um, in your own experiences that the voice of communities uh, where they heard at COP and where the debates focus on the UNFCCC member states only. Can I can I uh, say something about this? Am I unmuted? No, you're not. <laughs> um, because I think it's it's very complex and it's very frustrating. Uh, because you wonder whether the people, the lobbyists, uh, the fossil fuel lobbyists and all the people pushing back 
on the implementation of the commitments, whether they think they live on a different planet or they somehow feel that the implications of climate change are not going to touch them, that they can create gated communities or gated societies or, you know, alternatives. I mean, you think of even these, you know, rich billionaires talking about colonizing Mars. Well, you know, I'm sorry, there is no planet B. Uh, and we have this absolutely magical, wonderful planet that we live on. And we're in the process of destroying it. And I find it very difficult to understand uh, the, the level of denial that is that otherwise intelligent and competent people are capable of having in terms of the implications of what they're doing. So what I see important about the COP is, is that, you know, with with this um, these agreements, uh, the treaty, the Paris Treaty was uh, in theory a binding international treaty. The problem was that the implementation was left up to the country. So that's that's the, the escape clause, that countries decide how they're going to, to meet the agreements. And so what we have to do is we have to strengthen the pressure on governments to act in ways that are necessary. In that way, in that sense, in some ways, the advanced industrial democracies have a lot going for them because they have highly developed legal systems and they have uh, populations who are often capable of using those levers. And that's what I was talking about before, actually holding uh, fossil fuel companies accountable. People actually now in, in countries like the United States, those were suing their governments. You know, in, in some states, I think it was in Montana, where their state population, their state constitution requires them to protect the environment. And young people have sued them, the government, for being in breach of that. So there is a way in which from the bottom up, using the vehicles of legal accountability and the law, and actually probably trying to get legislative bodies to create more effective laws. I mean, would we create an international crime of ecocide? These, these are ways of pushing up from below and where people... Uh, you see, I think one of the problems with the fossil fuel companies, too, is that, first of all, whether they have persuaded themselves, it's not a big problem. I don't know. I don't know what world they live in, because the same way like tobacco companies who all knew that smoking caused lung cancer, but they could, you know, sit with a straight face, testify to Congress saying, no, it didn't. So I don't I don't understand that mentality. That is a death defying leap in um uh, truthfulness and uh, and sanity that I don't understand. But I think that the more we can use the vehicles that we have to hold people accountable, to hold governments accountable, that that begins to create the dynamic where the governments will have to move to implement the commitments that they've made. But the other thing too is attribution science is very important. There was a time when people would try to dismiss some of the terrible things, the floods, the wildfires, et cetera, that are creating such a huge cost of population. And, and incidentally, also in advanced industrial democracies, I'm a Canadian and wildfires in Canada have been, have been absolutely terrible. Um, and, and not, I mean, I won't even go into that, but I mean, the point is that, that there is no country that, that escapes. So what we need are countries that have civil societies that not only can 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 talk to the issues but that they have to try and create the constituencies for good policy that means elevating people's understanding and attribution science has been very important of saying you know no this isn't business as usual you know yes you, yes we've always had hurricanes but the, we can now calculate the extent to which this particular hurricane is in fact made worse by the by global warming, by the warming of the ocean and all that that entails. So as we create greater public awareness and then we use those levers that a rule of law gives us in terms of accountability and whether we can create these these um, these levers also by using some of the international mechanisms of law, such as the International Criminal Court or the War Crimes Tribunals at The Hague, for example. I mean, in many ways, the activities of some of these comp companies is absolutely uh, analogous to crimes against humanity. And, you know, when, uh, you know, the Nazis did it or countries committed genocide, you know, we've held their leaders accountable under those laws. We actually have worse things happening now where people are in fact acting in such a way as to put the entire planet at risk and also to all populations at risk. So that's a long way of saying that I think that what COP does is it helps to clarify. It also brings civil society people together. And whether they have 
an impact on the agenda at COP. I mean, they do, but whether they have as much as we would like. But what they do have is, is an opportunity to create even greater solidarity, to share best practices, to become a more powerful global network, which I think is, is extremely important. And just before I close, I want to say that, Shermal, I'm very glad that you're sharing this because, as you well know, in, in the Climate Overshoot Commission, our youth engagement group were extremely important. First of all, because you were all very knowledgeable. I mean, this was not... You know, some of you were technically very adept on many of the issues relating to climate change, but because you were also a reminder of the generational inequities uh, that that global warming presents. And again, as younger generations grow up, not being uh, fooled about climate change, understanding it, but also having the education and the 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 understanding of how to use the levers in their own countries and in the global community. We can have more and more of that push even before some of the youngest of you who are extremely valuable, before you have your hands on the levers. But this notion that somehow governments are afraid of losing elections, what they have to do is they have to be afraid that they'll lose elections if they don't act on climate change. That We have to change that calculus where it comes to be absolutely unacceptable. And some of the things that we view in the world um, can make you discouraged about that because there seem to be some extraordinary um, you know, capacities for denial and delusion, um, even in, in countries like the United States. But we, can, we have to continue to, to pu push for that uh, because it's not something, we're not going to have a COP meeting where everybody says, oh yes, I'm going to send my money and oh yes, we're going to phase out fossil fuels. And, oh yes, it's all going to happen because there's so much selfish, self-interest interest and as I say, the capacity for denial um, that that is so dangerous um, as well, even however inexplicable it is, it is a reality and it is a great threat. Yeah, thank you so much for your comments. Um, I don't know if anyone also has something to contribute, but otherwise I actually have a follow-up yeah. question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I can uh, jump in. Uh, I, I just want to first of all associate myself with the comments of uh, Her Excellency Kim Campbell in terms of uh, issues around fossil fuel and also in terms of uh, inclusivity and mention that issues of climate change are poverty associate, associated. Issues of climate change is about vulnerability level. It's about the level of resilience that you can be able to reach with the resources you have. Unfortunately, the developing world has got a big issue with the issues of resources. Therefore, any small impact calculates itself in a like a balloon because then the levels of uh, resources are very low. I want to give you a scenario whereby you want to represent yourselves or the community wants to represent themselves in discussions like the just concluded COP28. The whole issue is an issue of a club, of a club of workshop goers, a club of only people who can talk the language of the person who is donating the funds to them. And this becomes a challenge because then they don't have a neutral voice. They must sing to the piper. They must sing to the person giving them funds. And this becomes a big challenge. So what can, can be a solution to this is the issue of increasing the, the issue of ambition of money. We want more finances to go towards the last mile. We want to see our nationally determined contribution Raising, because in Kenya, we are promised to cut down 32%, equivalent to around 143 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. We can only support 13% of that. What that means is that we are way far from the commitments of Paris Agreement because of finance. This finance impacts every situation in the issue of public participation. It inhibits even policies getting to the last mile, and issues of this information reaching the last mile becomes a challenge because of finances. 
we call upon the developed worlds to see what this can be done in terms of raising ambition and increasing the level of funding so that then, because we know the polluter pays people is still being regarded as a very good uh, you know, negotiation basis so that then we can see that. And then more especially in the people who are polluting in terms of uh, fossil fuel, they owe us a very good explanation and a reversal in terms of loss and damage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, may I may I chip in on on the funds, um, uh, and this relates back to to the outcome uh, of COP twenty twenty eight. Um, so so here one one issue that in the negotiations which was not very successful was everything that had to do with article 6 and article 6 regulates uh, trading uh, so not direct uh, direct uh, support in, in terms of uh, financial flows but indirect through trading and uh, is in particular emission trading and uh, there was at the beginning quite some hope that there might have been some some breakthrough uh however however uh, in the end uh, there was hardly hardly anything uh, accomplished and uh, and so here we miss out on a mechanism that would have uh, transferred significant funds or have the capability to transfer significant funds uh from the richer uh, uh um, emission trading systems uh, to some who actually needed more and probably where the money could even be uh, spent more efficiently because you get more more emission reductions per dollar dollar invested investment out. Um, the one of the issues uh, and this brings us back to the to the discussion we we all had uh, Kim John and, and Akash uh, we all circling around this problem of. Uh, uh, of taking responsibility and countries taking responsibility. Since this is not negotiated and countries uh, uh, have not tabled uh, proper medium and even shorter term targets uh, that would enable trading, uh, uh, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg uh, issue now. So countries uh, don't have uh, really biting and more uh, legally binding um, targets for the near term upon which they would actually be willed to trade. And, uh, and therefore, if we would do trading now, then it would be trading amongst the very unequal partners and we could not observe true effort behind, uh, behind, behind an em emission reduction. And so, so here uh, uh, we, are, we are missing out a lot, especially on, on transfer of, uh, of funds. Uh, simply because uh, in the negotiations uh, we did not address the issue of responsibility. And uh, just to conclude, the responsibility is not only current responsibility, but there, since we are going for overshoot, we, will, we also have to consider um, historical responsibility. And this brings us uh, back to what uh, John said on uh, the polluter space principle. Uh, if you do these calculations, uh, uh, there is huge debt in the north, carbon debt, uh, so to say, uh, that will have to be tabled at some point uh, and to be properly regulated. Yeah, thank you so much for all of your inputs. And like, um, there's so many thoughts running to, through my head and like so many questions I want to ask. But I think one common theme between uh, the three speakers is that uh, uh, you mentioned uh, a lot about the importance of public participation and the importance of getting people to be aware about the climate crisis and to then use the power of the people to, and their voices to hold governments accountable. So as a last question, before I turn to a Q&A session with the audience, um, I would like to ask Akash, um, since you are a climate advocate, you've been working in this space for a long time now, and you have been using your platform to attract uh, the public's attention to the uh, climate crisis, I wanted to ask you um, how you managed to, or in your experience, how the through your observations, how can one convince uh, the general population of the life-altering nature of the climate crisis? And how can we build more um, 
awareness to the climate crisis, more support, and hence more public pressure to advance the goals that we need uh, for climate action. That makes sense. So um, how I feel about this is that we have somewhere made a mistake. We have put ourselves in the center of the world, that the world revolves around us, wherein nature is the one which should be in the center and we should be one of the living being around it, which revolves in the whole life cycle. Now, when we've already made this mistake for centuries and centuries, it's going to take a long time to change it. But how I feel that this can be done is, um, I come from India. I have a better understanding of this nation. So I'm going to share a few points from that perspective. Education is one. Um, when I've been in school, and even when I see the textbooks in school, I really feel that the thing which we are teaching to kids on the name of environment, it's not really what actually climate change is. We are somewhere trying to, I don't know what, temper them or not really give them the hard truth. And hence, we are never really educating them where the school should be the place where we educate them. So first, I feel that all the governments globally uh, should focus on bringing actual climate change, uh, climate science in the books so that can help kids. Another one, what I feel here is guidelines for media. Uh, we have several media publications out there in India globally. Um, now I see that there are people who are working as a journalist and they do have a better understanding of climate change as well. But still, uh, there are so many people who are ready to speak to public for climate change, but they do not really have the understanding of climate change. And that's where miscommunication takes place, right? That's where they end up communicating in a way like we saw that how history, history was made at COP. Right? Nobody really saw that, okay, how much budget they have actually given. Another one is marketing agencies. I really feel that I'm trying to work out for this thing in India for greenwashing. Um, any brands, whatever they are making, uh, they can go to reach out to an agency and they can tell them that, okay, I want to uh, market my product in a certain way that it's sustainable or it's green. And marketing agencies can just make it happen for you like this because they are creative. They know how to do it. But then um, who is really taking a watch on it that whether the thing which these brands are marketing on TV, newspapers or everywhere, is it really sustainable or not? So we really need to stop greenwashing. Another thing I feel is how in India, uh, no tobacco brands are allowed to market themselves. Similarly, I feel that it should not be allowed for fossil fuel industry brands to market themselves publicly. So that we can start slowly bringing down this thought process of dependency on fossil fuel. Because if I'm marketing my product every day on all the screens possible, wherever this user is engaging, it's going to go wrong because I'm accepting that, okay, this is part of my life and I need to depend on it. Another one is a similar guideline, which we have media, we can have for social media and internet. Because on internet, at least in a media house, there's a committee which sits over there. There are owners who own this platform. So they want to do the good for the channel so that they can keep running the publication. But on social media, everyone is free to share whatever they feel like. And I hardly see that there is a guideline when it comes to climate change and sustainability. People can, uh, majority of the people, if we really look out when it comes to climate change and social media, the conversation on major scale revolves around plastic. Versus I'm like, plastic is hardly a small portion of the overall crude oil, right? There are bigger issues we can talk about. We can talk about methane. Another one is uh, we need to work with local stakeholders or administrations um, because obviously this problem is global. Yes, we are facing it globally, but we can't solve it globally. Every country, every um, constituency or um, district has its own way of living the life. And one example which I can share here is I was born in the city called Indore, which is in a state of Madhya Pradesh. Um, this city has been the cleanest city in India for the last seven years. How did they do it? How did they change the people to not throw plastic around, litter around, and not urinate in a public spot? How to respect the city? They have really used the pride of being the cleanest city and infused it in the citizens of the city. And now for them, it's a pride. They feel it that, okay, my city is the cleanest and I want to keep it that way. Because before, wherever you go to any city, if I end up telling that hey, I'm from Indore, if they are in India, they might know of it. 
and they'll be like, oh, is this the cleanest city, right? Is it right? Is it really that clean? I'm like, yes. Trust me, even the only person from India like who got to be on the stage of COP28 was Narendra Modi ji, the prime minister of the country, along with the mayor of the country, uh, of the city Indore. He was invited there to share how they did it. How did they convince people to not litter around? I have been to European countries. I have been to different countries, uh, cities, I mean. And I've seen, even in Paris, I would see plastic or trash littered around on a main street where we can really say that the people are really well-educated as compared to India on an average city. They have far more money. Um, they have a better life. But still, why there's this they don't have this understanding that I don't want to destroy my place. We can use the same method to educate people on this. Another one is uh, leaders and celebrities to come in picture. And if they can lead, it will really help a lot. One of the things which I can again share here is the prime minister of the country, Modi ji. Uh, whenever you look at him, he would wear an Indian traditional cloth and that to made out of locally. And that unknowingly influence everyone because yes, people look up to him and how he can leverage his influence in the country is really helping it out because um, eventually we do want to cut down on the global consumption, how we can bring it to local consumptions. Another one last I can share is um, entertainment industry because when people are, uh, whenever we want to sell a product, club it with something entertaining and people will buy it. Right. You want to sell your clothes. You want to sell your mobile phone. Give it to a celebrity, show it into a movie and people will go crazy about it. Similarly, there's this one movie recently came out. It's called Animal in India. It is facing a lot of backlash for se several issues. But one of the things which I really liked in it, that how in this movie, which has nothing to do with climate change, a character to another character ended, ended, ended talking about how we as a company have given a contract in the Kerala district, which is related to mining, and it's really going to destroy the estate. And it's a conversation happening in an entertainment movie, which has nothing to do with climate change, but how we are normalizing it. That yes, it is happening. We are not making science a thing that, okay, you have to get into a university or a degree. That's where you read about climate change. Climate change is an issue which is related to anyone and everyone. We have to bring it to everyone. And in a language which people can understand. If we keep putting up climate change in a language which is full of jargons and technical, normal user won't understand. And uh, that's the book which I've done. I'm a climate optimist. It just focuses on that, that how we can simplify climate change to the individual citizens of the country. And then they can influence when they want to vote. They can see that not only that I want to vote because my leaders can, a leader can offer me education, good roads or uh, energy throughout the year, but also I want to check that whether they are working on climate change or not. And this has been growing constantly globally, but not at the pace at which we want. Thank you. You know, Thank Ashtar, you so if, I can just, if I can just say yeah. that, um, you know, your optimism is, is, in, is in some ways very well founded because there are many things that even 10, 20 years ago we thought would be impossible. I think back, you know, the, the, the phasing out of smoking now, smoking has just gone to other countries now. I think China people are smoking, but there was a time when, you know, in a country like Canada, people thought, well, how will you ever get rid of smoking? Smoking is so cool. Now it's not cool. Um, but and and all sorts of other things uh, where the, I mean, the costs of wind and solar. I mean, for a long time, people say, no, there's, that's impossible. We can't go that way. And now the whole economic uh, calculus is totally different. So I think when we're feeling very depressed about things, we do have to remind ourselves that, in fact, we do make changes. And there are many people who are trying to discourage us. And as I noticed that one of the questions that was asked was, what do we do when there are no alternatives for fossil fuels? But that's a big assumption. Yes, there might be today yeah. no alternative for fossil fuels for aviation fuel. But there are many people deeply committed and deeply involved in finding alternatives. And that's the most important thing when we understand that some of the transitions are more difficult than others. Some of the, the, the use of alternatives is different. But as long as we understand that the end goal has to be to get there, then we'll, we'll have investments in time, energy and resources to try and find those alternatives. So I think I'm going to sit next to you in the optimism bench, because I think we have to be optimistic, because that's the only thing 
that helps us to continue to believe in the capacity of people's creativity. And I find that Kenya is just the most wonderfully, I've been there and it is a most wonderful place um, with, with incredibly wonderful people. But, but, but also, you know, again, um, having created enormous uh, achievements, even though you have many things that you still need to do and, and, and resources that you need. But there is no country that has a monopoly on the right thinking for dealing with this crisis. So we have to know those stories, tell them, and use them to reinforce our own capacity when we get up in the morning to keep up the good fight. Indeed, and even when it comes to when I'm talking to people about the problems related to fossil fuel, and if I by chance end up advocating for electric vehicles or hydro fuel cells, so yes, always the problem pops up that, okay, for now all the electric vehicles are charged by eventually the energy which is produced out of coal or non-renewable energy. Um, and the another issues pops up is that, okay, how, how um, the batteries are a big issue, right? The reason I have optimism is because I meet a lot of people. Um, while in COP28, each and every startup we had over there who featured their solution, I went to each and every one, one by one, learned what are they doing. And that's what drives my optimism. Because I know that there are companies who are constantly working, not once, several companies who are constantly working to see how we can recycle the batteries itself. Yeah. There are companies and alternatives to, to the batteries that we have now that will address these other issues. Yes. Exactly. And another thing that how people do not really want to give time to a solution. Uh, for example, whenever it comes to charging stations, they be like, okay, the charging station is electric, but then the energy is coming from, from uh, non-renewable. And my counter to them always is this, only that you have to give them time. Uh, a company cannot deploy the whole project in one go today. That, okay, I'm going to point uh, install my ins uh, charger as well and the solar panel company who run as a business with a strategy. So they've installed, installed the chargers. Now when we see that the people are increasing, the charging is increasing, and when they can afford to have solar panels on each and every of the station, they will do that. We can't really be, so it, it somewhere, it, I'm taking the conversation somewhere, else, but somewhere it connects to my childhood. How I was this kid who was trying to do good, but nobody would give me the space. Yes, I made mistake. Yes, I failed. But we need to give me, parents needs to give me space that, okay, let's give it a chance and we might do it. If you really uh, go strict on them, you're not giving them the space or trust that, yes, you can do it. And this is what I try to do when it comes to solutions. I work with all the brands, a majority of them who are still today seen as uh, non -sustain, uh, not sustainable. But I know they are the one who has the money, who has the courage uh, or the resources and the possibility to make something sustainable. If I want to talk to a company to make electric vehicles or hydro fuel cell, uh, whom should I go to? The best is I can go to one of the already up and running company like Mercedes and I can tell them that, hey, uh, people gonna switch and I'm working towards switching people and so many people like me are working towards uh, making people understand that we need to go to renewable. And if you wanna, as a company, as Mercedes, if you wanna stay in the market, you should also switch. And they really love this narrative rather that I go as a negative person to them and bash them off that what you're doing is wrong. But again, I need to give them time. And I think that's how I feel that we can reach towards a solution, but also that we parallelly have to work with the uh, public and citizens that how they also need to allow time to people. I know uh, I uh, am contradicting myself, but I want to be very clear when it comes to giving time. Yes, we are short on time. So the frameworks we set, we have to stick to them. This doesn't mean that, okay, the transitioning period can be uh, unrealistically long, which can surpass the limits which we are trying to set for 1.5. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the discussion that's been really fruitful. Um, I'm... I've been looking at the questions from the audience and speaking of climate optimism, a part of it is about thinking of solutions, right? And so I think one of our attendees have asked um, on your opinion of uh, maybe perhaps like a financial incentive system, which is designed to reward countries that successfully reduce their carbon dioxide emissions to motivate countries to both grow their GDP and cut emissions. So for example, EPRAS of the World Bank with Mozambique uh, committing 50 million for the reduction of 10 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions through forest conservations and other measures. 
I'm sensing that perhaps attendee would like um, the speaker's opinions on a similar financial incentive mechanism um, in the international flora and your take on it. I would him to share with me, like as a leader, what she thinks that government is capable of doing this. I think I think we already try to do that, uh, creating different kinds of incentives. But but Michael is very much uh, in in the line of of uh, new research, etc. And he might have some views on on how these incentives can be deployed. Yeah, well, the, this this uh, brings us back to this uh, Article Six of the negotiations uh, on. Uh, uh, there's there's one section in Article 6, and this is bilateral uh, cooperation. So you see quite many countries uh, from the north uh, doing bilateral projects uh, on uh, emission reduction. Um, uh, you know, the, almost every, every country has a deal with another country. Some of it could actually be or is actually rebranding of... Uh, 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 development assistance, uh, so one has to be cautious on on what's really what's really the 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 the, the additionality here. Um, the other issue, uh, just as in the in the comment by by our um, anonymous uh, attendee, is um, is uh, through the international development banks, so that uh, we actually have uh, uh, loans. Uh, uh, or concessional loans uh, that have uh, additional stipulations on emission reductions. Um, one other issue which is now quite hotly debated uh, is uh, uh, that for nature swaps, and nature could also be not only be uh, reforestation or, or forest conservation, as it, as it was mentioned, but it could also be deployment of renewable energies uh, and uh, and other other measures. However, here uh, uh, it's a great idea, but and it uh, has been discussed some twenty years ago already quite uh, vividly, but then kind of uh, fell dormant. Um, however, when we look at how many of the industrialized countries respond to that, they still insist on repayment and rather. Uh, not give up on 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 their payment. So here, this is this is a little bit of a struggle, and uh, uh, by far the largest would be actually the the an emission trading system, and there we are really stuck, as I as I mentioned before. So here, uh, financial transfers uh, overall, as we see them today, are typically at least an order of magnitude. So this means ten times uh, too little, or many times hundred times too little. And uh, when we, uh, as uh, uh, Akash uh, mentioned before, the uh, the loss and damage uh, uh, money that was uh, announced with this 770 million uh, is absolutely inadequate uh, in terms of, you know, what's really needed and, uh, and what's, uh, what's, uh, what's actually required. And the same thing here. And uh, just um, as a final thought on this one, uh, nowadays, uh, especially in most of the, the tropical and, and, and sunny countries, uh, uh, solar and uh, to quite some degree, wind is actually the cheapest form of electricity production. However, it requires a lot of capital and capital investment. And many of, uh, of these countries uh, have uh, huge uh, um, uh, um, financial risks associated with them. And so here, just purely risk sharing between uh, a northern country and, uh, and uh, a developing country to get these capital intensive uh, technologies deployed is a very simple solution. And uh, we see some of it, but also again, uh, by far not enough. Can I just say that part of that calculus is, is the understanding that what the less developed country is doing actually benefits the developed country. I mean, that's what we forget. Oh, yes. All of these, all of these steps to mitigate climate change benefit people thousands of miles away. So, in terms yes. of risk sharing, and there's nothing inequitable about that at all. It's it's quite selfish absolutely. to do it. Absolutely, absolutely, and it, and actually quite cheap. It's really cheap because it's the cheapest form of electricity production these days. Mm -hmm. What I can add to the uh, financial incentive is something I, I really have good things to share here, uh, which is practically happening in the country in India as of now. 
which is government central government is uh, giving 30% subsidies uh, to individual rooftop panels solar panels so mm -hmm. anybody as an individual in india who want to buy um, solar panel 30% subsidy and anyone in india who want to buy a two wheeler four wheeler so it can range from 25% to 30% of subsidies on all the electric vehicles, including two wheelers, three wheelers, and four wheelers. So that is something I feel that in India, I can see it's happening. Uh, though I never really try to appreciate India way too much because it's like, if I appreciate way too much, they'll be like, okay, we are doing good. Let's just stop, let's not work. So I always keep criticizing them as well, but this is something which I can share, uh, which is actually happening. So I do need to appreciate them as well for good they are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's really great that you guys are all, you know, coming in together and contributing to the response uh, to the response to the audience's questions. Um, so we actually have another question from the audience, and um, we we have been speaking so much on like um, the policy level, the government level, and there's a question about what we can do at an individual level. Um, so the attendee asked, in the name of growth, there are unnecessary production of resources like textiles, electronics, and other things. So how can we go about resource management at the individual level? And I believe Akash wrote a whole book about it. So maybe you can also first answer it. I think uh, it has to do a lot about our lifestyle, how we have been brought up, the kind of family we have lived in. The, uh, it's I, I have friends. One of the friends I can name over here is Keegan. Kuhun, he's a documentary filmmaker, director of Cowspiracy, What the Hell, and several like that. If you really look at his lifestyle, he, the whole family, brothers and sisters, everyone live a very sustainable life because that's how the parents have taught things to them versus we live in this world. Okay, cool. Let me answer it in a little spiritual way. How it works is a human needs appreciation we are seeking it we are seeking what is social media i'm going to put up a picture people are going to like it people are going to comment and i'm going to feel happy so many people liked me so many people commented on me so i'm popular that's everybody that's what everybody wants and now uh, whosoever i am i can't i I'm, I'm really lazy i don't want to work on myself i don't want to grow my knowledge i don't want to really be out and because that's difficult that's too much of an effort so what i do is easy what people want, they want money, they want watches, they want car, they want fancy clothes. If I wear them, they're going to appreciate me, right? So this spiral of being appreciated by people makes me, and also the taboo in the society that if I repeat my clothes, somebody might come and, uh, come and comment on me in a uh, in an upper high level society. Hey, didn't you wear this dress uh, two weeks ago in that party? And that really makes people feel... Um, threatened or insecure about themselves and how we really do that we all are insecure on a some or the other level but uh, most of the people how do they try to fight it rather than sit and talk to themselves and understand uh, write down their weaknesses and strengths and work on it what they really want to do it can i just cover it up that's what um, greenwashing is that hey can i just cover it up there is something wrong behind the wall i can just make another wall right um so that's what we need to get rid of. And again, it's not an easy task to get onto. As I said, it's a lifestyle. So it will take another lifespan, at least two more generations. If we really start implementing these educational lifestyle changes in kids, then two generations that we might lead uh, or reach to a place where the generation understands that I'm comfortable with the person who I am. I do not really need to buy um, constantly a new device or new clothes, textile. And that's what the waste is all about. And that's why fast fashion is also a thing that I want to wear something quickly and throw it off. I have a good dress, expensive one and everything, but still I want to throw it off because if I wear it again, society will comment on me. So as a society, we have to understand um, that how our thinking is really digging a grave for us. I think um, that there's a lot of things happening to try and challenge these. Fast fashion is a, is a good one, because I think a lot of people don't realize how much garbage it produces. Uh, the EU has created regulations requiring all electronic devices to have the same charging connections. When you think of the waste yeah. for things being thrown on cords, I mean, there are a lot of things that can be done through sensible regulation, but also with knowledge. And one of the things that I think is interesting is when you can connect the waste of 
you know, landfills full of clothes and, and you know, the creating of uh, uh, methane and all that kind of stuff, but also with the with what we're doing to animals. And I think people are very concerned about what we're doing to the animals, particularly in the ocean. And that a lot of people who might not otherwise pay attention, if you connect it to them in something where they can, they can respond, either the lives of certain people or the lives of certain species or whatever, then I think they think differently. And one of the things that we should do is we should be putting out lots of posters of people like Steve Jobs, who only ever wore jeans and a black turtleneck. You know, the most creative people in the world don't have to change their clothes every day, uh, or at least wear different ones every day. That that conspicuous consumption is often, you know, a substitute for, for a genuine achievement. And um, if we can help to to change people's, I say this as somebody who's always kind of wearing a black turtleneck, but that, you know, if you can, you know, find ways of, of connecting people's personal goals with a different approach to consumption. I think that we can make those kinds of changes. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, you're right on that part. Okay, I'm gonna let Michael speak first. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, ju just, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, my, my institute participates also in this IPCC scenario work. And what many people don't know is that uh, uh, you know, the, the, the share of uh, uh, electricity switching to renewables is actually a minor climate wedge. Uh, it's actually most of it uh, uh, that uh, makes us really reduce the emissions is actually uh, related to consumption and uh, energy um, efficiency improvement. And uh, and I think th this is this is a little bit of a myth that, uh, you know, when when we think we 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 substitute uh, very quickly elect uh, electricity production to renewables, then we solve the problem. No, no, by far not. Uh, there is so much uh, consumption uh, that uh, we commit to. For example, just eating food uh, from uh, uh, specific sources uh, also contributes quite a lot to 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 emission um, additional greenhouse gas emissions. So it's really. The core, it's very easy for us to point to the fossil fuel industry as the evils and so forth. Uh, however, you know, jumping into a car and uh, drive somewhere is actually creating a, a lot of emissions. And we really need to start from each individual. So, so, so that's, we need to take this very serious that uh, individual responsibility is an absolute must. Yeah. yeah. yeah and one thing I think. Um, one thing what I can share here okay. is that I just want to, I don't want to just keep it I words. Think, so I think Sorry. John is, I think John was trying to get a word in edgewise there. Yeah. Okay, cool. No, John, you want to uh, go ahead? Okay, uh, fine. I think it's all an issue of developing in a low carbon pathway. We must agree to reuse. We must agree to recycle. We must agree that the omnibus that will carry responsibility is called policy implementation. We all have nice policies in our countries, but implementation is very low. So if we are able to support implementation of the good climate change action plans, of the good climate change legislation, of the good climate change policies, then they can live beyond our cycle of life and be able to implement what we cannot implement individually. But we must agree, even as we develop our industries, we must develop in a low carbon pathway so that then there is sustainability, there is evidence of reuse, there is evidence of recycling, and more important, futuristic look in terms of what we do on a daily basis. Over to you. What I wanted to add is that rather than just keeping words and uh, presenting solution that people should be doing or um, we should be doing in the future, I just want to share quickly the things which I already practice. So I don't want to be like that, okay, I'm asking you to do things and I'm not going to do it. Um, I live my life out of two bags. One bag which has all of my camera, gears, air laptop, everything. And the another bag which just has six pairs of clothes. And that's what I run on. I do not have a home, do not have a car. I live out of Airbnbs. Uh, wherever I have to go, I live, try to find a sustainable place to live in. 
and uh, i've been a vegan for last 8 years to cut down on my methane emissions as low as i can i've been a vegetarian from childhood but then still i felt there is contribution which i'm putting into this by fueling the animal agriculture industry every day by buying the dairy right and how i genuinely try to switch on each and everything this laptop which i've been using for last 8 years till the time i feel there have been so many new versions being launched by the companies but what i really believe in buy one good quality product which might cost you a little more money but when you see in terms how long you use it so in terms of carbon emission and in terms of the money you invested it will come down to be lower than the average as compared to you buying a cheaper product which you're going to use for a little bit of time and then it's going to break down and then you have to throw it out and then go buy again right so it similar goes with a uh, plant based diet veganism or similar goes with textile that people talk about wearing sustainable clothes but a sustainable cloth doesn't mean that you're going to buy every day and throw it off it is made sustainably but the way you're using it the way you're throwing it off you're making it unsustainable thank you Yeah, thank you so much for all the very valuable inputs. Um, I actually, I mean, I know I'm a moderator, but I also have something to say about this because I think this is uh something that is very it's hard to answer because it's specific to the individual. So, for example, um, me being in Hong Kong, like. 80% of the public takes public transport so for me reducing my energy consumption in the mode of public trans in, in the mode of transportation is easy for me whereas when i was in the us a public transportation system is not comprehensive so it's almost impossible for me to commute through public transport during my time when i was studying in the us but i also just wanted to remind people that there are actually a lot of resources out there now online available um to to educate people on ways how they could go about resource management um so when i was 15 and i first started out the sustainability journey obviously i was a teen i went on instagram and i found actually a lot of um people sharing their resources on how to go about with adopting a zero waste lifestyle um and now there are even for example for me uh, coming from east asia the biggest difficulty for me at the time was reducing my meat intake because a lot of the dishes that i grew up with are mostly meat based um but now there are i follow at least 5 or 6 um uh chefs uh, at home chefs that are recreating dishes that i grew up with um but with a vegetarian or vegan take to it and um i think one thing that is also important to remind yourself of is that in this journey of you know managing your own consumption is not an all or nothing race um i used to think to myself that it's either you know i have to go all the way out and be as commit to a zero waste lifestyle or i've failed but it's also okay to just take these incremental steps um so yeah i hope that is helpful um and i guess we could also take uh, one last question uh, from the audience before we conclude the panel um so somebody had asked in the discussion that um so somebody had asked according to the bbc authorities of the cop28 host country were originally planning on signing oil deals during the conference how is it possible to lend credibility to the commitments taken at cop28 when the presidency is suspected of defending the interests of and depending on the fossil fuel industry good question <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well i uh, i think uh, one would also need to ask is uh, who were the the other countries or companies that actually wanted to make the deal mm -hmm. uh because typically it's an entire network and not an individual actor mm -hmm. and uh, when you look into that uh, it's pretty much everyone and especially again uh, many of the very rich countries who are currently fearing uh, you know uh supply insecurity they they want to make these deals uh, out of you know an understandable calculus but absolutely amoral in terms of uh you know using the venue to discuss these kind of uh, issues so so again uh i think we we need to conclude this one uh, with a uh, with uh, a a an impetus to to call for individual action because it actually matters whether you know how you, 
whether you drive a car, which car you drive, uh, whether uh, you actually use uh, other alternatives, because this is the most powerful um, way to go about it, uh, to ask from uh, 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 from company leaders uh, and uh, to some degree also some of our political leaders to act is, uh, is probably not by far not enough. And the, the biggest power is on the individual with their choices. I think you should add that if we looked at the, the discussion about the, the communique, uh, it was clear <clears throat> early on that the, the chair and host of the conference was trying to get uh, a wording that was much more favorable to the maintenance of fossil fuels, and that those who were present, including uh, representatives of small island states and others, were able to pressure that change. So what we might think of as not the optimal wording, transition away from fossil fuels, was very far from what I think the chairman uh, and host of the conference hoped to achieve. So that is that should encourage us that uh, that they didn't get away with it. They may have been doing more things than they should have in terms of, of fossil fuels. But the other thing I would say is that countries that are still subsidizing fossil fuels, um, I think that those are that those are very worrisome trends as well. Um, I mean, I understand they're sort of short-term scenarios, et cetera, but uh, we need to constantly push back. And I think that COP28 uh, showed that the, the, the calculus of UAE uh, was misplaced if they thought it was going to be a great deal deal making venue for them, and they would be able to weaken the global uh, commitment to dealing with climate change. Well, thank you so much for all of your inputs and your thoughtful comments. Uh, it's been a great pleasure uh, moderating the session and to just hear your thoughts on uh, the recent COP28 outcomes and the politics and nuances of climate action. Um, I believe that we have ran way over time for this uh, session, but it's really, really great that we have generated this sort of exchange and discussion, especially with all of us coming from very different backgrounds, uh, all working on a very different aspect of uh, climate action. Um, so once again, thank you so much uh, for all of our four panelists for joining us today and for taking the time to speak, whether it be day or night, and for the audience for engaging um, and to ask us all these uh, critical questions. And um, I look forward to having these future engagements again. And thank you so much also for the opportunity for me to have a seat at the table to engage in these high level discussions. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Great discussion. Bye.